Benvinguts, bienvenidos todos. Welcome everybody. This is uh, the first session we have this morning. We have a very busy mor morning and at the UPF because now we have the the different hours for the different uh, TFH. How, how can we call it in English? The the final project for the degree. And uh, we have three winners and three short presentations that we will learn a lot uh, about uh, the three students we have here. And uh, after, at 11, we have the individual presentations of the different masters. So you will split, I guess, in, in the different sessions, and we will uh, know the, the coordinator of the, of the different programs. But first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Michael Oliver. I'm the director of the department. And so we will, I will meet some of you in one of the programs I am teaching, which is the wireless communications. It's a new master that we are very uh, pleased to, to, to start. To, uh, together with the UPC. But uh, now, uh, until 10, uh, Anders, which is the director of the communication and is uh, responsible of the organization of this, this event, will introduce a little bit how is organized the, sh the session and will uh, we'll give the floor to different uh, persons we have on the, on the table. OK, so Anders, please. Okay. So just I will be very very brief. So uh, this is the second edition of the of the this award. So the the idea of the award is to promote excellence among uh, bachelors or undergraduate students in in Spain, especially those of course in an ICT related area, which is the the focus of our department. Uh, this year, so last year actually there was no award ceremony, so, but this year we thought that we should give some uh, prominence to the winners and so we invited them to come here and give a short presentation of their works. Uh, there's also been a new modality this year which, is, which uh, um, Xavier will, will talk a little bit about, which is the uh, reproducibility award that we funded through something called the Marie de Maestu Excellence Program, which the department uh, was awarded this year. Uh, and uh, so uh, maybe you want to say something about this? Yeah, um, so our department um, this year uh, got a, a recognition which is uh, given by the Spanish government, which is the Maria de Maestu uh, Award. And uh, it basically recognizes excellence uh, in, uh, in university uh, departments and also promotes the idea of a strategic uh, programs for uh, these departments. We are uh, really proud to be the, the only uh, engineering department in Spain that has uh, such, a, such an award. And uh, as part of uh, the strategic program that uh, we have uh, put together, uh, one of the core ideas is to promote uh, reproducibility. Uh, reproducibility is becoming uh, a fundamental aspect uh, for good research and for research that aims to have as much impact as possible. So the idea is that uh, when you publish something, it's uh, very important if you want this publication to be of relevance, to, to have some impact and to be used by other people so that what you have done can be reproduced. And uh, in the area of ICT, what it means is that apart from the publication with a, a well-described uh, uh, process and explanation of what you have done so that someone can also do it, you have to uh, supply the software that you have used uh, for your work in, in a way that is uh, well explained, that people can uh, actually compile and, and use that code. And also typically in a lot of the work we do, we also use data. So ideally, uh, you, we should also uh, provide the data, ideally also open, so that uh, people can, uh, can use that. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, that's uh, not that common still. Um, a lot of the work and a lot of the undergraduate thesis that uh, many of you have done and uh, have, uh, people do even at the level, of course, of master thesis and PhD thesis and research done by faculty, really we do not follow yet this type of uh, 
practice that by now I think is quite uh, quite quite clear that what we should do. So anyway, so we decided to to promote that also at the level of undergraduate thesis, and so we uh, organized this uh, the prize within these awards that we're giving specifically for the, the idea of reproducibility at uh, at the undergraduate. Uh, uh, thesis level, but again, I think that's a very important concept that I would like you to to take and and to use in uh, in your work in in this case in the master or in uh, your future research. Okay. So is it past, uh, okay. Okay. So uh, the winners of this year's uh, award, actually, the the bachelor's thesis award was shared between uh, between two people, Natalia Delgado, who will present her work which is titled Developing a Software for Automatic Synchronization Between Tonalities and Colors in Audiovisual Music Therapy, and uh, Arancha Casanova, Fusion of 3D Data for Interactive Applications. And the winner of this uh, Maria de Maestro Reproducibility Award is Adria Garriga. Uh, his work is titled Solving Montezuma's Revenge with Planning and Reinforcement Learning. So part of, so the prize, these prizes have a cash pr part uh, but also part of the price is to pay for the tuition of the masters should they decide to enroll in the master of UPF. And I believe at least, I, th I believe both Natalia and Arancha this year will, will attend the, the master's programs. Um, so I think we will invite, uh, uh, I think you have uh, decided that Arancha will go first. <laughs> yes, so. so do we give the price first or, or no? <coughs> should we give the price? Ah, okay. Uh, okay, so we'll, sorry, okay, so well, we'll invite you all up to, to, uh, to give you the prize before you give your presentations. So if only we can step up here. <coughs> so Arancha is the first one, right, <coughs> which is the, the winner of the this thesis award. Okay, so here you have. Okay. <laughs> Natalia Delgado is the, also the, the co-winner. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Adria, the Maria de Maestu one. <laughs> okay, so... Okay, so Arancha is going to give now the talk, right? Before I dive into the project, I need to explain what Kinect devices can obtain. Apart from normal color data, we can also obtain a depth image, where um, for every pixel, we can obtain the distance from the pixel to the camera. Combining these both information, we can obtain point clouds in 3D. This is, for example, a frontal view of a point cloud um, of a room with several objects, and this is a rotated view of the same point cloud. Later, we're gonna see it better in a video. If we work just with one Kinect, we can have a limited working area here. But the objective of this work is to increase this working area by using two Kinects. We need, of course, an overlapping area to detect um, similar points. To have these both Kinects working together, we need to register both sensors. And the way to do this is, is with some registration techniques. Here in this work, I explore the classical registration using a chessboard pattern and a new method using a finger detector provided by Exibol Studio. So to sum up, the idea is to, to combine both point clouds in a single one.
capture by one sensor. And this is the other one, captured by a second sensor. If we, if, we, if we fuse that together, we have an increased span of the, of the room. To validate this registration, we have used an application using a hand tracking provided by Exibol Studio. The idea is to increase the interaction range of both registered sensors in front of just using a, a single sensor. Here I will briefly explain the workflow of the registration, which consists in taking SGD plus dev data, convert it to point clouds, and then apply three different registration methods. The first one, extend six, is the classical method. The second one I'm not going to explain today. It's just an intermediate phase. And the last one, uh, our proposed method, is the automatic finger detection. Finally, all these methods go through a refinement block to obtain a, a better registered point clouds as an output. The first, the first registration method consists on having key, point, key points or similar points in both overlapping viewing area of both sensors. This means that in this case, we consider a chessboard in a still position captured by two different sensors. Here we have different points of views. And the key points we identify are the corners of the chessboard. If we have these corners, we can extract a transformation matrix that can relate the camera coordinates, where we have our point cloud, to the world coordinates, having as an origin this point. The, of, the, of the new system's coordinate. If we do this with both, mm, with both sensors, we now have two different point clouds fused together in the same system's reference. This uh, was done following the work performed by Zhang. Here I put the reference. This is the result I showed you before in the video. We have here one, one point cloud, connect one, Connect to the second point cloud, and the finally, and finally the, the scene fusion. And now our method follows a different approach. Now we don't detect chessboard mm, corners, but we detect the finger as a, as a key point. So now imagine that I have two different connects pointing at me, and in the overlapping area, I draw a path, for example, a square as we see here, two different squares, or just a spiral. So for every um, timestamp that we detect a finger point, we consider this as a, as a 3D point, and we construct a whole um, point cloud using these detections. Here we have an example where this is a point cloud. Here I drawn two different squares at different depth. And the orange one is the captured by the Kinect number one, and the red one by Kinect number two. If we, cal if we calculate the transformation between these two point clouds, we can obtain the registration matrix that we will later use. To see that it works, we, ha we can see the green cloud that is the result of applying this transformation to the orange cloud. So now we have the correspondences matched. Finally, we have a refinement block. We have used um, we have used iterative closest point as a method. I'm not going to explain. I don't have time. Here's the reference. As an initial alignment, for example, we have um, maybe the floor is not well aligned, the chessboard no, um, also not well aligned, and when we refine this this cloud, we see that now it's fixed. To validate the registration, we improved a hand tracking application. Here's the workflow. Having mm, two sensors capturing real time, we put a detector in each one of them. And one of them, mm, the output of one of them needs to be registered to the other sensor. So we apply 
the, res the registration matrix we obtained before, so now we can have a fused interaction space. All this is fit to the tracker. As a first example, I draw a um, rectangle mm, through all the um, interaction space. We see in green detected points from Kinect 1 and in red from Kinect 2. We can see that the rectangle drawn is a smoothly um, transition between both Kinects. A second example with another shape. Here we have the, the visors briefly, briefly appear. If we use just one Kinect, we could either have red or green points. In this case, we have both. And as a final example, uh, I, I draw my name. This is just using the hand. There are zones where both green and red points are present because it's the overlapping area and other zones where just red or green points appear. So now as a conclusion, um, we can say that comparing both um, registration methods, we um, see that for what it comes when, when it comes to error and computational time, we have similar results, but using a finger detector instead of a chessboard gives us a main advantage that is user friendly. We only need a user and we don't need extra material. And it's very easy because we only need maybe five, five seconds or less to draw a square. And we have both sensors registered. And for the application, we see that it has been improved because it almost doubled interaction range. So thank you, that's all. Hello. Um, I am Natalia, and my project consisted in developing a software uh, that synchronized automatically um, tonalities and colors for audiovisual music therapy. Um, this project started uh, during my Erasmus experience in Holland, where I met a PhD student that was developing a new method for music therapy, in which she proposed visualizing uh, changes in the harmony of music through colors. Uh, when I met her, she was trying this in an orchestra concert, and what she would do was um, analyze the musical piece and then decide when the changes would take place, and she would change them manually with an application. Now, th this had some problems. It was mainly a, a manual, manual work, which uh, turned out as inefficient and would probably turn out into a, project, a product that would not be very accessible since it would be quite expensive. So um, a solution was proposed, uh, providing with efficiency through automation. And this would result as a software, which would be the final result of this project. So this project is centered in the um, design and development of this solution. Even though uh, usually we go from the beginning to, we start explaining the beginning and then explain the end, I thought it would be interesting to see the final result so we understand better what this project is aiming at. So I'm going to show a demo. What
Okay, so um, in this short extract, you can see when at some points, the changes were very small in color, like from blue to purple. And this is um, showing there is a quite stable moment in music. And then there are moments when, for example, we have red and then blue. This drastic change is showing uh, a musical, te uh, musical tension. Um, what is meant by musical tension? It's like a sensation generated um, in a person when you feel the urge of the music to fall into a more liberated state. So, well, I, um, I studied uh, engineer and I love music, so this is basically why I thought it would be interesting to, um, to develop this project. And to obtain the main, the main objective of this project, which was um, uh, providing with efficiency through automation, I divided the objectives in four main objectives. The first one, making an extra automatic extraction of the harmony. This is obtaining chords, the chords from the musical piece. After this, um, these chords are, are expressed as intervals, and then these intervals are mapped into colors. After this, um, they are both reproduced, the colors and the music, and the idea is that the harmony changes synchronously with the colors. And finally, since uh, an external software was employed, um, an evaluation of the of this software was also made. So the first block is um, has the objective of obtaining a list of chords from the MIDI file. How do we do this? Well, first of all, MIDI files look this way. They are written in binary chord, and they have to be interpreted into um, into a list of commands with a timestamp, a command, note on, note off, and their frequency values. These values were then represented as frequency in a, in a time axis, and they were divided into, 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 time chunk, into time frames, which are bars. Why do we do this? Well, to define a, a chord, it is important to define when the chord starts and when the chord finishes. So we have to use the unit in music, which is beat. The problem is that beat tracking is not an easy task to do. And these results were not accurate, which would result as not having accurate results in the chords either. So an external software was employed, find MIDI chords. After using the software, we had a list of chords, and these chords were interpreted as intervals, which are, ju are jumps in terms from one chord to the next, in terms of half, of half steps. These intervals were then mapped into colors. How was this mapping done? The idea is that the maximum tension is represented with complementary colors, and the rest of the tension, middle tensions, are represented by the middle colors. Once we have the colors, um, the list of colors, they, they, would be, uh, they would be executed as changes in colors of light, and the music would be played synchronously, as we saw before. The idea is that the changes occur synchronously, but the real thing was that this wouldn't happen since we had, again, a problem of beat tracking. To go back from a list of colors to the moment in time when this happened, we need to go back and use beat tracking. So um, to offer a quick solution for the PhD student, another software was generated where um, the values in time could be introduced um, manually and demos could be done. Also, um, a, performance, uh, a performance evaluation was done of the, of the um, external software employed, uh, Find MIDI Chords. To do this, we, um, I based um, chord derivation on speaker derivation. Um, this is based on dividing a audio recording in homogeneous regions and um, uh, uh, corresponding and deciding which region corresponds to which speaker. In this case of speaker derivation, in the in the case of chord derivation, we divide uh, the regions, which are uh, bars, and we say that each chord corresponds to a different region. So this is a task that Fine MIDI Chords is doing, and to evaluate, we compare to a ground truth. 
that was uh, done manually. And we evaluate with the station error rate. So the objective is to minimize this value. And these were the results. Um, the, mean, the mean derization error rate was 29.11. This means it's around 70% of correct answers. We thought this was um, good enough. And finally, well, conclusions and objectives. Um, most of the objectives were achieved, even though some of them were not obtained the way we initially thought they would be done. And well, I like to think of this project as um, the design of a product and the development of just the foundation. So I would think it would be nice to f follow, um, I mean, continue it and uh, change some things, future work, like um, uh, beat tracking or using real synchronization, unifying the software since um, I use different software and put them together and we'll maybe doing a better interface and uh, music style extension since I didn't save it. This was, we thought it would, this would be just for classical music. So that's all, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Adria Garriga, and I'm going to present my thesis, which is Solving Montezuma's Revenge with Planning and Reinforcement Learning. It has been done here in UPF, and my supervisor is Anders Johnson. Um, so, um, why did I focus into this game? So, a while ago, in 2015, DeepMind, the AI company, released a algorithm called Deep Q Learning, which and basically attached neural networks to Q-learning and um, was very successful in playing Atari games, such as this one. But um, it was very successful with a lot of them, but with some of them it was really, really bad, like zero score bad. And the, the problem is that what this algorithm does is, at the beginning, it doesn't know anything about the game, doesn't know anything about the domain, only knows that there is some vector of values that comes in, and some of them give rewards and some do not, and that it can move controls. So what it does is take random actions until there's some reward and then it says, oh, I should follow up from there and it does that. So the problem with this game and others is that the rewards don't come unless there's, there's a really, really small chance. So for example, in this game here, um, we have this character that has to get the key and um, he has to go down on the uh, outlined path and that takes more than six seconds, which is more than 60 actions, which with a branching factor of eight gives this really low probability of reaching a reward. So you're not gonna get anywhere by random exploration. So what I did was focus on this game and just by um, working in it, um, I, I made the algorithm play well. So um, this is the game. Um, the character has to explode all this pyramid and the problem as before is that you have to explore a lot. The previous best scores are um, um, this 3,500 with uh, a novelty baseline that tells the algorithm that, that some states are new, so it gives extra reward for exploring more, which is what we want. But wasn't there at the time of starting the, the work, and the other is the one that I'm basing on, which is um, via planning instead of learning, which is um, looking basically at all the possible futures and taking the best one. So if we look at enough futures, we can reach the keys. So, um, first thing I did was reverse engineer the game and look at the memory of the, oh. So this is the memory of the, of the Atari console, it's only 128 bytes, and some of them mean things. Um, and that is used in the rest of the work. So, 
this is the algorithm I was based on, which is iterated with, and it does a breadth first search on the graph of all possible actions and states, and um, stops searching in the, in the states that are not novel enough. And states that are not novel enough are those that do not feature a RAM uh, direction, RAM address, with a different value. And um, by using that algorithm, which um, got that pretty nice score, um, the character in the first screen only explored these places. So as you can see, for example, um, there is no two points with both the same y and x. So, well, there are, so because here it expands other um, RAM addresses and down here, it doesn't go to left, it doesn't get to the key, it doesn't explore enough. So what I did was, instead of pruning so much for each of the values, um, I started only pruning when the position is the same. And that was basically the key to, to reaching the key. And that gave some, some much better baseline score. Um, the original algorithm called for doing this not for just the room x, y uh, RAM address position triplet, but for each of the addresses. But there's just not enough uh, computational power in anything I can have access to to do it. So instead I did that. And with some other improvements that are listed here, the algorithm ended up working pretty well and getting um, 15,000 score, which is a step up from 500. So um, one of the innovations that um, I did for, for better exploration was screen pruning, which means that um, with a certain probability, well, I don't see the pointer, oh there, with certain probability, when we arrive to a new screen, we mark it as explored and we don't get there. We prune everything, every state that gets in there. And that, what obtains us is um, exploring faster um, and further. So for example, here we have um, 13 exploration steps. So at each step, what the character does is ex um, explore all the possible states around, pruning for position, and then it moves a little and then it does the same again, then it moves a little more. And as you can see, this is the succession of, of uh, states. So first it is in the orange blob, then in the blue blob, the other blue blob, the red blob, etc. So um, as you can see in the first frame, it explores the nearest parts, then a bit farther more, farther more, farther more, and it reaches the next reward in this case, from here to here, in 13 um, steps of exploration. And, but with pruning screens, because we sometimes randomly prevent access um, to another screen, it reaches only four steps. So what happens here is the, the first step, the orange one, explores all these screens here. But it doesn't explore this screen because it's been randomly pruned. Sometimes it happens, it's just luck. But with several explorations, we can often get lucky enough that we get really fast to the possible goals. Um, so that's what I did for planning. Um, all these um, crutches to the algorithm so that it could work and get some reward. And then I focused on the other approach, which is learning, which, as I said before, instead of looking at all the possible futures, we take some actions and then we follow through the place. Um, in this case, uh, I didn't use the fancy neural network, deep view networks. Instead, I just used a, a table with all the possible values, and by taking some of the memory addresses, I could construct a small enough table uh, of only 800 megabytes of RAM. So the problem remained of the no rewards even in the first screen, so if it, it did random stuff, it wouldn't arrive to the goal. So I gave it a, a potential-based shaping function, which basically means that when the, uh, when the character climbs the gradient of this, uh, of this screen, it gets more reward. So I did these two gradients, and basically the character does, does correct, follows to the key, and then gets out to the right. And um, using learning in, um, in 20,000 episodes, we get to a really nice reward of more than three, which is, means that the character gets the key and gets out the door as it should. And adding options, which are sequences of actions that are predetermined that are deemed good, which I handcrafted, it's even faster. So with more domain knowledge in all, it always gets better. So, well, conclusions. Um, domain knowledge is very useful, always. Um, 
in both settings with the main knowledge and with more uh, domain knowledge of the game itself, not of games in general, um, is much, much better for the algorithm, so it, it performs much better. Um, the exploration is very important in these settings, but unfortunately what I did here is too specific to this one game to be useful for more, but it can be not too difficult to generalize, which is what I'm doing now. And reward shaping and learning really helps also with sparse rewards. And for future work, um, that's basically what I'm doing, regeneralizing approach to other similar domains, which is Atari games that are reliant on position, and maybe use some uh, really nice uh, machine learning to, to automate parts of the, of the algorithm. So for example, the novelty calculation, instead of looking at RAM values directly, we can make learning on it, or we can use uh, planning uh, a, a frame predictor instead of the emulator to explore, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is the references, and um, if you now allow me, I'm going to show a short demo. faster so that um, we don't have to wait a lot but with planning the the character really makes the optimal actions to get to score so yeah and then here the algorithm fails a little because uh, it does not take into account this part so it just uh, randomly moves a while until it gets out but it works. And in the end, it gets the promised uh, 15,000 score. So if, if the full screen starts working and we can see the score at the top, <coughs> if it works ever. Yeah, OK, now you can see it. 15,000 score, which is really nice. And so that was my thesis.